Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Tonight, um, in our series of uh, learning our history, it's one of those nights dealing with a kind of a dark side of Jewish history. So, if you want to mark down uh, several names that makes a difference for our lives, names like Rashi, I assume that we all familiar names like very famous uh, Rabbeinu Gershom, uh, Maharam from the city of Rothenburg and others um, is the core discussion. We are about 10, 11, a little bit times around 12th century e Europe. Um, some background, when we are talking today, 21st century, and we try to imagine or to understand in our level of comprehension what happened to our people about a thousand years ago, it's kind of hard because as much as we understand, some of us heard stories of World War II, World War I, by any means what happened to our people at that time, it's in some ways way serious and way deeper. And one of the questions that I always kind of resonant in my heart and mind is how a great guys like Rashi, the one who wrote the commentary for the entire Bible, not only the five books of Moses, but also the whole Tanakh, the whole canon, wrote the whole commentary of most of the Talmud, whatever we found. How a one person at that time on a parchment, taking a quill, imagine if someone gives you a quill and a parchment, and ask you to sit and write down a commentary over the Parsha, over the Chumash, over the Talmud. Um, how far and how much a person can do. It's a not only monumental work, but a little background. So it's when we are talking about Ashkenazi, that, that's the first core part of our discussion, is the Ashkenazic Jewry. The Jews of Europe, East and Western Europe, and we go back to the 10th century, it was mainly in a two kind of two central um, states. One obviously was in France, and the other one it's the um, in the mines, is a, um, a city that in the borderline of the Rhine River, which later on have a yeshiva. Yeshiva is like a those days rabbinical college, place that people study. Um, it's estimated that the whole Ashkenazic Jewry that we recognize in the 21st century was based at that time of 1,200 families, about 1,200 families. That's all. We all came out, all the Ashkenazic people in this room, or anyone who watch us, we based on those 1,200 families that live there. Um, the key leader, which I would like to give some words, because has some effect to this very day, was a great rabbi by the name of Rabbeinu Gershom. Rabbeinu Gershom. Who is Rabbeinu Gershom and why is so important? Let's understand the historical context. Our people live in those small villages, in those cities, and the community is in a way segregated. They have certain rules. Time of persecution, soon you see, time of a lot of crisis, the community must be united. We cannot afford to have not only fighting those enemies in outside, we cannot fight, afford to fight each other. So it was a great rabbi at that time for the Ashkenazi community, whose name is Rabbeinu Gershom. And he put, which called to this very day, Hadag. Hadag is abbreviation of Chet. Dalet Gimel, Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom. Anyone in this room ever heard of the Cherem, of the Rabbeinu Gershom? Rabbeinu Gershom Cherem, several examples. For example, um, let's say the idea of polygamy, the idea that men cannot marry more than one wife. We all read the Torah, and in the Torah you see stories of Abraham, and Jacob, and later on the era of the kings, you read how many of our people, of our leaders, 
have more than one wife. And in the ancient time, it was kind of common to have more than one wife. Rabbeinu Gershom came in as the head spiritual leader of the Jewish community and he said, we cannot afford, which call in the Talmudic language, tzara, almost like a tzore, like a problem, that the wife have a competition within the household. And therefore, he rules that anyone who is basically married more than one wife will be under the harem. Harem, in general, is a term that instituted much earlier in the Talmudic era, which is a ban, an excommunication. If you do so and so and so and so, no one's going to talk to you. You're not going to get aliyah in a shul. No one's going to do business with you. And it makes a difference. It can make it or break it for people. So no one wants to be under the harem, under the nidui, under the excommunication. So he puts a rule against polygamy in Ashkenazi community. Men cannot marry more than one wife. Now the consequences, it's to this very day, which is, just as a side note, the Sephardi communities never accepted that because he wasn't their leader, wasn't their rabbi. And we all know, know we learned two weeks ago, the moment the temple destroyed, the second temple, right, in Tisha B'Av, and our people scattered around the world, and we segregated in our own communities for 2,000 years, and a very small crowd left in Israel, in Palestine, the rest of them scattered around the world. The reality is that each community, in a way, assimilated to the cultural. You see the song, you see the dress, you see the behavior, you see the language, that each, each, so the good news is, you see today the fulfillment of the famous Isaiah prophecy that he said, "Venik betzu kol amim yachdav ki gadol yom Israel." He said that it will be a day that all the Jewish people who scatter around the world will be together in one place, and we are so fortunate to be since the establishment of the state of Israel, not so many years ago. Um, um, Witnesses to that, that the Sephardi marry Ashkenazim, that, that people, you can have a husband from Iraq marry a girl from Russia and vice versa. But it's also set its own problem because the Minhagim, the traditions, sometimes are different. So for example, in the Sephardic, they never accepted the idea of Cherem the Rabbeinu Gershom. They never heard about it. And they marry more than once because they live under the Islamic world and as we assume by now know the rules of the Islam, not just the Sharia law, but the, the structure of the Hadith, the structure of the Mu'attazila, the structure of the, those Islamic places, it's basically um, the idea that people are um, um, uh, adopted the, the, the tradition and the culture of what they live. And those Muslim countries, they allow up to four wives. And it was comment, yes. But also in Yemen, they didn't protect orphan children. Excellent, excellent, thank you, thank you. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you. What she said, so everyone can um, uh, be familiar with that, she said very wisely that the, 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 it wasn't only persecution among the Jews in Europe, in Ashkenazi communities. It was also somehow, not the same level, but also in the Sephardi communities. To the extreme, it was the communities in Yemen. So the tradition, and I heard it personally from a few close friends, Yemenite rabbis. Um, um, I heard it from my very close friend. His name is Rabbi Shlomo Korah. He's the chief Sephardic rabbi of Bnei Brak, one of the religious cities in Israel. We are very close friends for many, many years. So I heard a story from him and other Rabbi Admoni and other Rabbonim among the Yemenites that in those days uh, the sheik basically rules any girls that not get married up to the age of 18, the sheik is going to take her. And it was a great fear among those tribunal places and those places that live outside of Sana'a, Sana'a was the capital, those Baladi and Shami and others who live far away villages they're afraid of those um, um, sheiks. 
So what they do, they set up those girls in a very young age. So you have sometimes a man that marry more than once just to, in a way, to protect, to redeem those. So, but they treated each other like sisters. It was total different culture. When you talk Islamic world, the mindset, the, the thinking, it's a very different culture. For us, Western, it's very hard to comprehend um, a Middle Eastern understanding. But that was, in a fact, a, a reality, the polygamy. When they came to Israel, the early days, so the 48, they have issues. Later on, the Israeli government rules that basically poly polygamy is prohibited. Even here, it's only state of Utah for the Mormons and certain places. Um, most of the states, the United States, not allow polygamy. So those people need to live in the modern Israeli society, which is, is not allowed. But up to recent years, it was common among the Sephardim to marry more than once, again, follow the assimilation of those um, um, tradition and culture, follow the Islam. So back to our subject, when Ashkenazi community follow Rabbeinu Gershon, he is the key leader in the city of Mainz. He is have a big yeshiva, big rabbinical school, and he wants to have a clear structure that protect the respect and the autonomy of the communities. And therefore, he rules, for example, Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom. Anybody who marry more than one wife, you total exercise to excommunicated from the community. You have no future in the Jewish community, which makes a big difference for people. Another thing he has is the taxes. He structured the taxes in a such a way, almost like a governor in our language, that has to be equal. Another thing he did is the idea of get. Get, in general, in the Talmudic terms, is documentation. Can be a promissory note, can be a general document between lender and borrower. But in our kind of modern days understanding, we only take get for the bill of divorce, which was as one phase of the Talmud that deal with husband and wife. Because the rabbis, based on the Torah, institute the idea that it should be a ketubah. Kesuba is like a marriage contract between husband and wife, and he spell out certain amount of money in case he um, divorced her or passed away. So, the same way, if he wants to have kritut, meaning to cut the relationship, bill of divorce is called get in the rabbinic writing. So, up to Rabbeinu Gershom's time, they just, the husband have full power, which means the moment the husband decided that he wants to divorce her, he just go to the Bet Din, go to rabbinic court, they sitting a session of three rabbis. You know, rabbinic court, just for your knowledge again, there are three different categories of rabbinic court instituted earlier in the Talmudic times. It was the basic court, which is uneven court, three judges, three rabbis judges, very erudite, very smart. And then it was the highest level, which was 23. It's called Sanhedrin Ktana, the small, um, uh, relatively supreme court. And then the highest court, are dealing only with the very high, complicated cases that applies to the entire community, it was called Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is from the Greek language that basically applies to the people who not show favoritism, but it's the 71 judges. The whole idea it came from Moses, that God told him to select 70 erudite elderly people to control the community and to be in charge of the community. So it was 70 plus Moses, it's 71. And then they basically reinstitute within each tribe their own small court, which later on to this very day is called Bes Din, which is uneven number. One, two, and then the third one is the Avbet Din, is the chief who basically rules in an uneven ways. So what happened at that time is a person can go to a Bet Din and give uh, his wife with two witnesses a get, be al against her will. Rabbeinu Gershon comes in and said no, it's not going to happen anymore. In our communities, we have a new set of rules that only with her consent, only if she agree upon receiving the get, then 
it will have an application. Otherwise, a person who give a get to his wife against her will will be ostracized from the community. All right? So that, again, it's new. Now, culturally speaking, again, as a side note, you talk about Islam earlier. In the Islamic world, it's enough of utterance. A person said three times, you divorce, it's over. In the Jewish law, it's a contract. It has to be written, spell out the date, the time, the location. Two witnesses need to sign on the bottom of the document. It's uh, made in the old day. Nuances needs to be writ uh, um, written properly. Need to hand it over by the Beth Dean. She receive it. Af upon receiving it, she need to bring it back to the Beth Dean. The Beth Dean tear that and give her a certificate that she is divorced. That's to this very day. So Rabbeinu Gershom instituted that uh, among Ashkenazi community, a man cannot give against his wife will get. Right? You know some cases like no, that, I, right? I, I mean, I, I just I find it very, that the man can get to get when he wants it. But a woman, no matter what she says, cannot institute a get. And in a lot of cases, the woman does, the man blackmails the woman because he doesn't want to give a get. Okay, so and what Rabbeinu Gershom accomplished in that sense, in the Ashkenazi community, is a very good point, is for the women, in a sense, that the men cannot have the total control to give her a get against her consent. But what if she wants it, he's not the one? So, so as I said, this is thousand years ago, so it was the first step. Obviously, uh, when you're talking 21st century, there's a long way we went through, and many, many things change. How and change? It, it, I, I tell you how it changed, because if you look today, uh, in, in Israel at least, it goes sometimes to the extreme, that in some cases they say that they are, the judges are so kind of afraid of the public opinion and public views that some Israeli papers spell it out, even secular, that the judges go so far for the women that the men left out. So it kind of, modern days is very different. But even here, last week, two weeks ago, rabbis were arrested because they were kidnapping men and trying to get, convince them to give get to the women who are in limbo, whatever they call it. Where Aguna. 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 And where they, they, they were kidnapped, they were arrested for kidnapping the men to try to convince them to give gets to the women because they refused to give gets. What happened many times, it's a very good point, uh, you hear constantly rabbis talking for prenuptial agreement and all of that. Many, many times it happens that, that the woman will stay capture as Aguna because she wants to be divorced legally by Jewish law and many states recognize that as a need, as immediate and he basically said if you give away part or full of your um, uh, sustenance rights or monetary rights etc then I'll give you the get and the rabbis try to eliminate that so many rabbis, I know I give you a small example, I have a friend he's in Baltimore He's Orthodox rabbi, his name is Mintz. So I once, I was invited to a wedding just as a witness that he officiated. So he insisted that they have prenuptial agreement prior to the, and he explained the people publicly that he is very much for prenuptial agreement to avoid this type of situation. But Rabbeinu Gershom in that sense, for the Ashkenazi community, he was one step in that direction. He basically enforced upon men within the Ashkenazi community not to um, um, hold the wife capture, meaning or not to give her the get against her will. Another thing he did, it's um, called a, um, letters, which is you writing a letter and you don't want anyone to read what it's written in your letter. So you basically, I remember my oldest daughter, my oldest daughter study in Baltimore in Besyakov. So Bracha, my oldest daughter, she had a pile of letters to her friends or whatever it is, and she put on the cover of the envelope, Chet Dalet Gimel. So we know already that that's prohibited for us as parents to even look. Why? Because it's abbreviation of Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom, which means since the time of Rabbeinu Gershom, it's an institution in the Ashkenazi community that if 
Mr. A write a letter and he put it in the envelope and he put these letters, it means that you are under ban, uh, you are in violation of the law if you open and read what it's written in the letter. It's like concealed letter. Show you the power of the rabbis and Rabbeinu Gershom, especially Middle Ages time, in all these rules that um, to this very day, the beauty of that, we are about a thousand years later and to this very day, you see the great effect of Rabbeinu Gershom to, 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 to our days, that people still follow his rules. So here's a yeshiva in a city called Mainz, and that was the centerpiece of learning in the Ashkenazi community. One of his students was Rabbi Yehuda. There are different Rabbi Yehuda. This Rabbi Yehuda we're talking, it was a very important name because he was the teacher of Rashi. Rashi is abbreviation, is a resh, shin yud, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki in those days it wasn't last name, so it was basically son of Yitzchak, of Isaac. Rabbi Shlomo, son of Isaac, abbreviation of Rashi. There are out several movies, the one I, I highly recommend it is Rabbi Beryl Wine movie, is an organization called Destiny Foundation. So he made once an excellent movie, it's called The Life of Rashi. And it's an animation, but it's, it's beyond good. Really excellent job uh, Rabbi Bell Wine did. So Rashi, he came in his early age to that yeshiva of minds, and um, he became Rashi. Rashi is like in the, any, any school, in any place in the Jewish world, any place, you basically can say you cannot study a Parsha, a Chumash, a Tanakh, a Talmud without Rashi. It's almost like attachment to the text. It's a, it's a must. So uh, I heard once from Rabbi Beryl Wine, he gave a, just a good metaphor to understand the value of Rashi. He said, imagine a mother carries a child at about the age of five and she wants him to cross a very dangerous road, like a highway. And she holds the child's hands. And the child, imagine, will never make it if he or she needs to cross that dangerous road. But because the mother holding the hand of that child, the child able to cross together the mother and bring the other side of the road. So that's just an example of sometimes is so complicated, technically, technical details, um, um, complicated subjects, in, especially in Talmud, and without Rashi, all the rabbis, no exceptions, will tell you that it's impossible. So the beauty of Rashi is that, um, that he was a rabbi, he was a teacher, he was a scribe, he was a judge, he was the owner of, of very la large vineyard, he owns a um, like in modern days, it's like big wine company. And um, he was a father, he was a grandfather, and he was also father-in-law to very important people. So obviously he was a Gaon, Gaon meaning super brilliant or, or ingenious, but it's hard for us to comprehend because this is way before the, um, the revolution of a printing press. And this is way before any form of copies. So, as we said earlier, imagine if someone give you a quill and a parchment and ask you to sit and write commentary in endless, so many thousands of papers, and you have three different editions. So he was very lucky to have two scholarly daughters. And in a way, the scholars agree that those two daughters, Miriam and Yochevet, was basically almost like a man in a sense of those days of scholarship. The several books out there, the, the stories of daughters of Rashi. But they became super intelligent and they are instrumental in helping the father in his big monumental work. And um, they, um, as we said, there's no, there's no way that you can have any rabbinic writing or any rabbinic studies without Rashi. Um, my teacher once said, imagine uh, 50 years ago, no one ever thought about cell phone, right? Today, show me how many people survive without cell phone, right? So, um, for sure, it's no comparison, but they build 
which called the House of Rashi. Now, the son-in-law, the two important names. One is name is Rabbeinu Tam. Is the the um, is a few version of what exactly happened. Some said it was his grandson, and one is the Rashbam. Rashbam is the commentator of several tractates. Some said when Rashi passed away, he was the one who wrote the continuation, again, ingenious um, uh, explanation of the Talmudic uh, tractates. Um, Rabbeinu Tam, just to give you an idea, the one of the uh, commentary, it's called Tosafot. When you look at the Talmudic page, you see the Mishnah and the, the text itself, the Talmud, and in one side you see Rashi, and the other side you see Tosafot. So one of them, it's Rashi's grandson. And one of the famous stories is that when Rashi, Rashi when Rabbeinu Tam was a little baby, a little child, he sat on Rashi's lap. And suddenly, as a little child, he grabbed the Rashi's tefilling, the head tefilling, and he held it, almost pulled it down. And Rashi laughed and he said, you're going to have a different views. And it turns that now, nowadays we have two different pair of tefilling. One is Rashi tefilling, that they have a different order of the, um, of the um, parchments inside the tefilling. And one is Rabbeinu Tam, that goes in a different chronological order. So in a way, the grandson disputed the grandfather. It's like prophecy came true. Now, that era is the era of the first crusade. And why it's so important for us? It's because for some people, we're thinking, okay, if we sent you to Columbia or, or, or Harvard or Princeton, and you have all the convenience, and you have the computers, and you have a fancy room, and great teachers, then you're going to graduate with A+, plus, etc. Rashi's time was a time of tremendous persecution. The first crusade described in the history of our people as a knight or a nightmare of our people. It was those mercenary soldiers that just um, were looking for some jobs and unfortunately the Pope at that time um, gather together and organize those people who have nothing else to do and they um, try to march toward Palestine and rule over the infidels, fights against the Islamic forces that control the um, Holy Land. So um, at that time during the spring, famous horrible dark spring of uh, 1096, it was the time that um, the crusade went and they decided why should we f go so far on our horses and wagon to the, the Palestine, we can have infidels here in our own places, which is the Jews. And they, they murder tremendous amount of Jews at that time. Um, one of the famous legend is that those forces that reached the Holy Land, they found around Jerusalem about 300 Jews and they locked them up in a synagogue and burned the building and this is not Holocaust of Hitler, this is 1096, the first crusade. And um, one of the, again, legend about Rashi, that he cursed their, their leader, um, uh, Prabulion. The story goes that Rashi said, you're going to march with those forces of the crusade to um, the land of Israel or Palestine, you never return home. So one legend said that it was a big rock that fell on his horse when he came back. Another one said that he died during the war against the uh, Muslims over there. But the bottom line is, the, the, all these first crusade that fought so hardly against those infidels eventually lost. The reason, historians said, it's because um, the Christians who live in Europe at that time was too comfortable and it wasn't in their interest to immigrate to a holy land. So those who fought against the Muslims and tried to conquer it, it was only temporarily because they could not establish a normal establishment of a new world of Christian life over there. Uh, but as we said earlier, the Ashkenazi community, and that's fascinating note in the Jewish history, that as much as they tortured the Jews, the same way as the, our people in Egypt, the Torah said at the beginning of the book of Exodus that Pharaoh put a decree against the baby boy that should throw them to the river, etc., and the Jewish people increase and multiply. This is very interesting 
subject to discuss in our history that because of part of that as much as the Jews were wandering Jews and, and fled from one location to another as far as building communities, as far as the building scholarship, tremendous scholarship. Um, um, one of the famous stories is about the Tosafot, those commentary on the Talmud from some of them from Rashi grandson, some of them from others. They said that when they jailed those people, they wrote the commentary with blood, meaning they, they, they just hurt themselves, they put blood on the parchment and wrote the commentary. It's hard for us to understand how far um, um, it was. Uh, you just need to read some of the side notes of the commentary on the Bible at that time and you see what people went through. They went from France to Germany, from Germany to Bohemia, from Bohemia to Latvia and to Poland and other places. Um, it was a time of a, a great agony and for sure in this crash course will not go too much over details but um, that's again one of the beauty of Rashi and other rabbis that they are able to produce so much scholarship and so much great wealth of wisdom even with that uh, tremendous uh, persecution so another example was uh, uh, Louis the nine in France he basically one of those evil leaders that rule to burn the Talmud. It was a public burning. If you go to Louvre or other places in France to this very day, you see a illustrations and paintings and some type of, um, it's not really painting, it's almost like a picture, but it's painting, described the great burning of the Talmud by Louis IX, which obviously traumatized the, not only the Jews in France, but the Jews in Europe at large but he also commanded to um, expel the, the Jews who refused to convert to Christianity from France. Um, another one was John in England, the King John in England, the same story. He also ruled to expel all the Jews, according to our tradition on Tisha B'Av, night of uh, the, the mark the destruction of first and the second temple, it's also marked the time that uh, Jews, uh, 4,000 Jews, about 4,000 Jews, expelled from England at the same time. So the whole idea of the wandering Jew that we heard and read so much, it's um, that time, is the first crusade, second crusade, etc. Um, um, many of the Jews were forced to jail. The trick of the jail was very, very cruel. They took Jews that were valuable to the community and they asked to get very large a ransom, very large amount of money in exchange of releasing that um, Jew again, vignette, just a small point, is Rabbi Meir, it's an abbreviation called Maharam, Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg, is a city in Germany called Rottenburg. And Rabbi Meir was the spiritual leader and the key, key scholar. And unfortunately, the Duke, um, the leader, put him in jail, obviously for excuses, not for real reason, and, um, and he asked for a large sum of a um, ransom in order to release him. Uh, uh, people get together because he was a head rabbi of Rottenburg, and it's inscribed and written in several books uh, that um, they tried to release him, to bring money and to release him. He insisted that he uh, wants to stay in jail, and he explained that it's because the moment they release him, they find excuse to capture someone else and they go the same thing. So he didn't want to set president. So he basically died in jail. He was there 13 years. The cruel part is that the Duke refused to release his body, which was relatively cheap compared to a living person, for another 13 years. And the story goes that it was a very wealthy, righteous individual in the city of Mainz that um, he traveled and he basically paid large sum of money to release the body and if you go to the oldest cemetery in Europe is in the city of Mainz you find a the gravesite of Maharam of Rottenburg, Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg and next to him was that fellow that gave the money to release the body of this great rabbi. So again all of that is a small part of our people, what we went through, the, the persecution 
Um, the good news is that all the Ashkenazi community survive and even thrive despite all of that, despite the persecution, despite the fact that they need to wander from um, a place to another. Um, I would like to conclude with a little story that um, two people asked me several days ago and to go much later, this is to the 18th century, but gives you the feeling of that time. Uh, how many of you know the story of the gefilte fish? Raise your hand. Gefilte fish. Where is the word gefilte fish came from? Gefilte fish. So gefilte fish, it's, um, you know, one of those Jewish delicatessen, you know, that uh, people eat, Ashkenazi eat on Shabbat. I never liked the jar gefilte fish, as you know. And um, even the other one, I try not to eat much. But if you know now the history of the gefilte fish, I'm sure that you have another second thought of that. So the way I heard it from several reliable sources, and again, it resonates the Jews in Europe. This is 18th century, but again, gives you the feeling. So in every shtetl and every village, um, it was a gevir. Gevir meaning one wealthy individual or two wealthy individuals. Most of the people live in poverty. Most of the people cannot afford fish for Shabbat. And people for Shabbat, for Shabbos, they have this idea to eat fish. It's part of the gladness and joyous of Shabbat. So it was a constant complaint to the rabbi of the communities that it's not fair. You have one or two gevirim that they eat fish for Shabbat and the rest garnished. They have nothing, right? So the rabbis call those gevirim and they said it has to be balanced. If you can get those big fish, we have to share. So the story goes that they brought day or two before Shabbat to the community kitchen several expensive fishes. And people brought whatever they have. Someone bring sugar, someone bring salt, someone eggs, someone potatoes. And basically they stuff it together in order, you know, so everyone can have a little fish for Shabbos, right? So it's called gefilte fish, it's like stuffing fish. The amount of real fish was very, very small, but everyone in the community feel equal and feel that they are partaking of the feeling of joyous of special day of Shabbos, right? So you eat a slice apart and have a tiny bit, you know, feeling of fish, but almost like a matzah, it's a bread of poverty, right? So it it's, uh, uh, represents the, 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 the level of, of uh, poorness and poverty that our people live there. All of a sudden, the Jews travel to a golden Medina, to America. You know, golden Medina is a land of gold. And as you know, many people to this very day feel that you go out on those trees, there's a lot of money. You just need to <laughs> grab that money and bring it, right? So, so they, they travel to Golden and Medina and all of a sudden they turn around, they twisted and you turn to be a delicatessen. So now you have even a non-Jewish gourmet and restaurants and others that put in their menu or they call it whatever it is, even kosher style or all kind of things. I remember when I was a rabbi in Naples, it was a non-kosher place that called himself kosher style in the most expensive part of the capital of, of Maryland and it was on the front of his fancy store was the gefilte fish. And many non-Jews visitors around the world, they, they used to eat it and it was expensive. But I always laughed to myself because the gefilte fish was like a matzah, it was a bread of poverty. But for the non-Jews, it's a great crackers, right, the matzah. And some of them dying to eat it, they love it. So the same way, the gefilte fish is not really um, a, a pleasant background, but they have the feeling of, you know, so it's now it's all of a sudden this delicatessen. I must tell you, I heard once a joke from Jackie Mason, which I think was really funny. He said, you know, to go to any, you go to any new Jewish community around the, the country, you always see a new kosher Chinese restaurant everywhere. You see kosher Chinese restaurant. So he said, we are taking care of the Chinese, you know, they, they, they come here, they have businesses with us because it's a kosher restaurant made of China. But he said, I never saw any Chinese said, I miss my gefilte fish. I never heard that. 
Anyway, let's wrap up our study of tonight. So what happened is, we start with the story of Ashkenazi community. We learn about Rabbeinu Gershom. And Rabbeinu Gershom, we understand that he instituted several takanot, several enactments, several decrees that to this very day, amazingly enough, how one rabbi at that time were able to do it in those early days in mind um, to have these rules such as a, cannot, a husband cannot give a get against the wife's will, um, uh, the law against polygamy, and the law against opening letters and, and equal taxes. But then we understand that from his yeshiva was a student by the name of Rabbi Yehuda who became the teacher of Rashi. And we learn a little bit about Rashi in the house of Rashi with his two daughters and two um, son-in-law that spread the house of Rashi to this very day is a core part of study to this, to, to, to all over the world. We learn a little bit about the Tosfot those great rabbi that wrote commentary in the Talmud. And then we touch just a little point of the first crusade and its influence on the Jewish world. Um, we a little bit touch the era of Louis the Nine and the uh, King um, John in England and their law of uh, persecution against Jews, especially Louis the Nine, the rules of burning the Talmud, which um, traumatized the Jewish world in the great length and in the near future, time allows when you talk about it. And then we talk about Pidyon Shvuim, uh, the mitzvah, the great mitzvah of releasing a captive that um, we in general are not allowed to sell Sefer Torah. But the Talmud tells us that in several exceptions you can do it, such as if you conditioned before you start writing it that it's for sale. So for example, if you want to support someone who have a large family in Israel and he's a scribe, and you give him a salary every month, and he writes for you the Torah, and you said in advance, I'm not, I'm not purchasing it, the moment he's ready, I'll sell it. So that's, it's fine, you can sell it. Or another situation, if the community needs to marry someone and people cannot help, you're allowed to sell Torah. Or you build a, a school, you're allowed to sell several Torah. And another one is Pidion Shvuim, release a captive. And in the, at that time, it was a tremendous agony for having the enemy the era of the blood libel that follow up is just capture someone, blame him for, for something, and then ask for a tremendous amount of money to the extreme who we'll use the name of Maharam of Rottenburg.